September, I was looking through my notes, back in September, I preached on bringing forth fruits that were meat for repentance. Right, what does that mean? That means basically that we would bring forth those things in our lives that prove that we have a repentant heart towards God. That's basically it. I preached on that. Uh, that's, that's how John the Baptist preached, that, that they would bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. Um, and that's basically a life that has changed. Now, I'm going to be preaching on repentance today. Some of it will be a repeat. Uh, but it's been said that you need to hear something seven times before you actually comprehend it. All right? uh, I heard somebody talking the other day, and, and they were saying that, uh, you know, I, I, I only remember hearing you say this two times. And the guy said, well, I've told you six times already. So uh, there's just an indication of that. But as we get into this, this, uh, this topic of repentance, there's going to be a lot of meat that you can take. And as I pray, that you would be able to apply it this week. Um, there isn't a lot that's known about repentance today. Certainly, repentance is not a word that is desired in the world today. The world has no desire for repentance because in order for there to be repentance, there has to be an acknowledging that you are wrong. Nobody likes to admit they're wrong. But in this, in this mindset of, of the case for repentance, uh, I'm going to read Job 33, 27 and 29, but we're not actually going to get to it until the end. Okay? The head starts someplace, all right? and this is, this is where we're going to start. Um, but what, basically what we're going to do today is we're going to look at what repentance is not. I'm going to explain to you what it isn't. And then I'm going to tell you why repentance. Okay? Explain the case for repentance, the biblical case for repentance. And then I'm going to explain what repentance is. All right. And so we're going to read here out of Job 33. Hopefully by now you found your place there. We're going to begin in verse 27 to 29. We'll ask God's blessing again on the preaching. Uh, and then we'll dig right on into this. So Job chapter 33, verse 27. says, And he looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned, and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not. He will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this time that we have to get into your word. Lord, I thank you for this avenue, this, uh, this uh, relative safely that we have here in the church. God, I pray that you would work mightily in us today. Father, I pray for the leading of your Holy Ghost in everything, Lord, that he would have free reign in this room for anybody that hears this. Lord, I pray that you would dig into our hearts deeply, Father, that you would use your sharp sword, the word of God, to pierce us even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow, Lord, and that you would discern the thoughts and the intents of our heart. God, I pray that you would lay us open before you this morning, and so that we would see who we are, and Lord, so that we would see you for who you are. Father, that the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified above all. We thank you for this. And God, again, I pray for the leading of your Holy Ghost now. I pray that you would anoint my lips and let every word that proceeds from my mouth be honoring to you. We thank you for it all. We pray it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So what repentance is not? Repentance is not a, uh, a human reformation. All right? It's not reforming yourself. Neither is it a change from unbelief to belief. That is not repentance. The devils believe also and tremble. They're not repentant. Repentance is not the acknowledgement of being a sinner while continuing to live in known sins. Repentance is not simply remorse for one's actions 
Asking forgiveness is not the same as repentance. One's conscience may make him feel sorry for his sins, but that's not biblical repentance. So what is it? We'll get to that. But first I want to show you why repentance. The biblical case for repentance. Why we must repent. Job 33 is the absolute best definition of repentance. And when we get to the conclusion of this thing, hopefully by then we'll have this case built. And you'll be able to see with clarity these verses here. The Old Testament prophets preach repentance. This is when you're looking, when you're looking at the Word of God, you look at especially any particular verse, any particular word. You look at where it was very first used, and quite often that gives you the overall definition of it, the way it's used throughout the Bible. There may be a difference here and there, but the context clearly gives that difference. But as we go and we look at this mindset of repentance, what was the call that every single prophet of God brought to his people? Looking at Ezekiel 14, 6, Therefore I say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. Now, did anybody go home and read Ezekiel 14 the other day when I mentioned it? Go home and read Ezekiel 14. All right? There's two different sections in Ezekiel 14 that, that need to be noted. The first one is, I think, verses 1 through 11. And the second is verses 12 to the end of the chapter. Um, but in there, uh, Ezekiel is, is challenged by some men that come to them. And God says, these men have idols in their heart. I will not be heard by these men because of the idols in their heart. And looking at that verse there, he says, repent and turn away from your idols. Turn away your faces from all your abominations. There's a call to repent. Ezekiel 18.30 says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel. Every one according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent, and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your, your ruin. That word iniquity is, is very strong. It's deeper than sin. Okay? It's your heart's attitude and love and intent behind the sin. It is the root of your sins, your iniquity. God says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not hear me. Now, how do you regard something? You honor it. You acknowledge it in your life. You give it a place. When a young man is trying to woo the love of a woman, he gives her great regard, does he not? He, is, he wants to do everything nice for her, brings her flowers, you know, calls her on the phone every day, and, and takes her out to nice places to eat, hopefully when they're not alone ever, and uh, all these type of things. It's, it's a way that he honors her. He is showing her great regard. And when we regard iniquity in our hearts, hmm, that's hindering our prayers to our Lord. Now, that's written to born-again believers. Okay. Those who have the blood of Jesus Christ covering their sins. And so looking at this here in Luke 13, Jesus says, Nay, I, I tell you nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Uh, I actually want you to turn to Luke chapter 13 really quick. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to point out about that. Luke chapter 13. starts out in verse 1, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, saying unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? Basically what Jesus is saying, Do you think that their sin was so much worse than everyone else's sin, that they were punished this way? He was saying this to people who were self-righteous in their own eyes, who were keeping the law. They were doing everything. If it could be done in the law, they were doing it. They were blameless. They were not sinless. 
Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they, they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, shall all likewise perish. Jesus takes their attitude and their question and directs it directly to their heart. You know, that's what the Word of God does. You come at it with a question, and you may be wondering about something completely different, something about maybe a location of a certain town, and so you see where it says about this in the Bible and that in the Bible, and it was north of this or eastward by this or whatever. And all of a sudden, you're studying it out, and God pries into your heart, and you see something that cuts you to the core. That's the way the Word of God works. That's why God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. This is where the Word of God is manifested. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that. Titus chapter 1 tells us that. You want to be where God is manifested? Be where the Word of God is being preached with Holy Ghost anointing. As we continue on here, uh, we, we have to examine this verse here. Verse 3, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Looking at that verse and breaking apart, what is keeping, what would keep them from perishing? What would keep those people from perishing? Repenting. Repenting is the only thing that would keep those people from perishing. Nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. You see the importance? Just in that, we could be done here, 11.35, and we could go home. Clay's closed. Oh, but there's more. Since you're right here in Luke chapter 13, turn over just a couple pages to Luke chapter 16. Starting at verse 27. We're all familiar with the account of uh, the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man is in hell and he lifts up his eyes and he's in torment and his tongue is, is uh, uh, burning because of the flame and and he sees Lazarus in Abraham's bosom afar off. And, and uh, he says, send Lazarus to give you a drop of water. And uh, then he says, uh, nobody can come to you and nobody down there can come out. And as soon as that rich man realizes that there is no hope for him to get out, he instantly remembers his brothers, his five brothers. It says, verse 27, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, meaning Lazarus. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. They have preaching. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, were those next three words, they will repent. He said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. What was the thing that was going to keep his brothers out of hell? Repentance. The rich man knows that yet today. Unfortunately, probably his five brothers know that yet today. Repent is not a word that the world wants to hear. That rich man heard that many times, I'm sure, while he was alive. But it's a word that every soul that is burning in hell at this very instant wishes they could hear one more time. Because they would. Repent. <coughs> Acts 2.38 says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord of Jesus Christ, for the, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, this is a verse that a lot of people get hung up on. Because there's two things listed there, isn't there? Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, the, of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. 
Um, there are some who would take that and say, okay, you need to repent and be baptized, specifically in the name of Jesus Christ. But I want us to look a little bit dif deeper than that. I want us to look at Acts 4.12. In light of that verse. And now I'm going to rearrange the words. I'm not resting scripture, but I'm going to put it in, in terms that clarifies this. And then we'll read it all again, and you'll see how this fits. What does Acts 4.12 say? It says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Peter said you need to repent and be baptized in the very name of Jesus. Fully immersed in his name. You see the clarity there. We are not just repenting and praying a quick prayer. We are not just reading a couple of scriptures, acknowledging that I'm a sinner and that I believe that there's a God, praying and asking God to save me. No, there is a full immersion in Jesus Christ that takes place. In order for your sins to be remissed. Repent and be fully immersed in the name of Jesus Christ. And your sins will be forgiven. Do you see the clarity there? When you take a part of scripture that goes contrary to what you have been taught and known. Or maybe what makes sense or what you've heard. You find where there's other scripture. If there's something in Scripture that contradicts itself, there's a different context involved. And there's a digger to deep. A deeper to dig. Apologize. As we're looking at this thing of repentance, we see that there is much more than just saying, I'm sorry. Somebody on death row can say that I'm sorry. But that doesn't mean that they have a repentant heart for what they've done. How many times have you had your kids say, I'm sorry, but you know very well that they're going to do it again the next opportunity they have? How many of you or I have told God, I'm sorry, knowing very well you've already made provision for the flesh to do that very same thing again? As we get into this, we're going to see that that repentant heart carries on into the born-again life. It doesn't end there at salvation. It becomes the natural stance of the born-again believer. What, but what this verse here in Acts 4.12 and is, is in, in Acts 2.38, it's emphasizing the power in the very name of Jesus Christ. There is power at that name. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is. Why do you think it is such a blasphemy against God to take his name in vain? Because there's a power there that we cannot comprehend in that very name. The name of the king in England in years past held with it a lot of power. If they were to proclaim something and his stewards were to go throughout the land and say, the king says this, on that very name proclaimed, it had power. It was efficacy. The very name of Jesus Christ has infinitely more power than that. And we are to bear it forward in the world. But in order to bear it, you must be fully immersed in it. And so you must repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Is that clear? Are we on the same page? Good. All right. Acts 17.30 continues on. And at this time, uh, this, is, this is Paul uh, giving uh, account here. And at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Again, we are giving the biblical case for repentance, why repentance is necessary for salvation. Why you cannot have a born-again Christian without repentance. 
You can have somebody who has made a profession of faith, but if they do not have a repentant heart towards God, they're still just as lost as could be. There were times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. That throws right in the face of anybody who would want to claim that there are only a select few that can repent. Repentance is available for any heart that comes to God. Anybody. Calvinism is a lie. This verse, if there is none other, which there are multitudes of them, but this verse, more than any other, at times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Everyone needs to. Now, question, does that include everybody in this room? Yeah. Have you already repented? God's saying, all men everywhere, mankind everywhere, needs to repent. Acts 26, 20, but it first showed first unto them at Damascus. Here again, Paul is, is recalling his testimony. He sure, uh, showed first unto them at Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and here it is again, and do works meet for repentance. It isn't enough to have claimed to repent. It isn't enough to have said, I have repented. If there is not a change in your life that proves that repentance, it's a lie. Now, it may be an ignorant lie. It may be a lie out of ignorance. You may have, have thought that you repented. You may have felt remorse over your sin, sorrow over your sin. Oh, but it still reigns as an idol in your heart. Repentance goes much deeper than just saying sorry and going back to the old life. There is a putting off of the old man and a putting on of the new. Cleanse your hands, all ye sinners, and purify your hearts, all ye double-minded. That is a command to the sinner to take that action. And here we do, we come and we sit and we say, God, cleanse my hands and purify my heart. You can't do it outside of his power, but there's action that you need to take. When I believe it was the Thessalonians that, that Paul is writing to, and he says, I'm commending you because you turned to God from your idols. Taking on what Ezekiel wrote there in chapter 14. To turn from your idols and turn to the one and true living God. But yet, how many of us still have an idol reigning in our heart? and to turn to God and do works made for repentance. Why did Jesus come? We're coming on the, the beginning of the, uh, uh, the Christmas season. It's the first Sunday in December. It's an exciting time. Uh, we've got some beautiful decorations. I thank the ladies for that. They've done a great job. But why did Jesus come? We celebrate Christmas because of Easter. Right? My favorite part of Christmas is Easter because without the cradle, we could not have had the cross. But why did Jesus come? You ask the world that. Why did Jesus come? You ask the average Christian that, the average churchgoer that. They'll say, oh, to, to forgive us of our sins. In part, yes. Oh, to uh, teach us and to, to show us things and, and to heal and and to, to show us God, yes, yes and yes. But why did Jesus say that he came? <coughs> when Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Have you repented? 
Sinner, this morning, have you repented? Or have you just prayed and asked God into your heart? Have you repented? Or have you just accepted Jesus? Have you repented or have you prayed the sinner's prayer? Do you see there is a difference? Your life will show it. The change on the inside will result on a change on the outside. There will be a change. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast forward a little bit in my notes to Galatians chapter 5. I had this at the conclusion, but God wants it right here. Turn to Galatians chapter 5 right now. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 19 and 23. The fruit of a God-given repentant life is a changed life. Born again. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Are those things still in your heart? Those are the works of the flesh. They begin as idols in the heart, and it is manifested in your works. If it is still manifested in your works, whether it's in the public realm or in the privacy of your own home, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, now what is fruit? Fruit is what comes of something. Being born again of the Spirit of God brings a change and it brings fruit. It brings more than just works. James clarifies that and goes further into this, that the born-again life is a changed life, and there will be good works involved with it. But the good works don't get you there. Good works are not repentance. But the fruit of the Spirit, when the Spirit is in you of a truth, and you have been born again, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now what's the difference between a work of the flesh and a fruit of the Spirit? They both begin in the heart. But where there once was drunkenness, there is joy in the Spirit. Where there once was hatred, there is love played out in the life. Where there once was filthy communication, there is now grace in your speech. Where there once was anger, there is peace. Now I ask you again, does your life have the fruit of repentance? What is your first inclination when something bad goes wrong? When something happens to you, Somebody says something to you. What is the first, the first reaction of your spirit within you? That's a good indication of your standing with God. That's why Peter said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Examine thyself to see if thou be in the faith. Have you repented? I've got to find my place back up here in my notes. Thankful for the reading of the Lord. Jesus also said, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that prays a prayer. No. Over one sinner that accepts me into their heart. No. Over one sinner that asks me to save them. No. Over one sinner that repenteth. More than over 90 and 9 just persons which need no repentance. The biblical case for repentance. 
Even in the Great Commission that Jesus gave, in Luke chapter 24, verse 47, it says that, that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. The very last commission that he gave, the very last command that he gave, was to preach repentance. I love Acts 1.8. I love the end of John. I love Matthew 28. I love all these places. The go ye into all the world and teach all nations. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye. I love all of that. But there are far too many who have taken that and forgotten that they are to preach repentance. Forgotten to preach that men must turn from their wicked ways and turn to the one and true living God. Peter preached and the Holy Ghost fell upon the Gentiles in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, Peter had gone, Cornelius had called him, had gotten that vision, and and Peter was there at the noonday, and he saw that, that sheet lower down with all those clean animals and unclean alike. And God told him, you take and you eat of all of this. And he says, no, I, Lord, I, I, haven't, I haven't ever in my whole life done that. And what God was doing was showing him, Peter, I'm preparing you to be able to handle what's about to happen. Because the Gentiles are about to receive the Holy Ghost just like you have. In his mind, in his Jewish mind, you've got to remember, there has always been God's people and then the Gentiles. God's people and the Greeks. God's people and the barbarians. And what Peter was about to find out was that God's people could be out of every kindred, every tongue, and every nation. And in chapter 11, verse 18, he's preaching, and it says, And when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. How did they know that? As Peter was preaching, they started showing signs of the Holy Ghost in them. At that point in time, those signs were to prove the message of the preacher. We no longer need those signs because we have the completed Word of God. Those signs were in part. You take a good deep study of Acts or of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. And you will see that those signs were a specific reason for a specific time, and there were some that would fade away and some that would cease. Tongues was one of them. By the way, the interpretation of tongues is not one that was supposed to cease. Isn't that interesting? We'll get into that a little bit later on, maybe. But what I want you to see here is that as Peter preached, the Holy Ghost fell on them. They didn't come to the, floor, to the front of the church and be met with somebody, and then they prayed. They did, not, they did not pray and ask Jesus to forgive them at that point in time. What did they do as they were sitting there under the convicting preaching of the word of God? They repented. Repentance came to them, and they were born again, and they showed signs of the Spirit. And the proof of that is, he says, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentile granted repentance unto life. You notice it's God that grants the repentance. It's God that grants it. Acts 20, verse 21 says, Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. That's to be our message. Paul, in Acts chapter 26, verses 19 and through 20, Whereupon, O king Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and what? Do works meet for repentance? Proof of a changed life. Paul wrote to the Corinthians there, after he had written his, his blustering letter to them in 1 Corinthians, he wrote that 2 Corinthian letter, and it had some glorious revelations in it. But it says here, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. In other words, a true salvation, somebody who is truly born again, will not repent of that and turn back to the old life. It's a salvation not to be repented of. 
being born again, you're born again once. That is eternal security, being born again. Hebrews 6, 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. What are the principles? Those are the, the, the primary things. Let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance. What is your faith built on? What foundation? Jesus Christ, repentance. You find in the Word of God where it talks about the foundation of your faith. And those two things will be there, Jesus Christ and repentance. Foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slack, slackness, but is long suffering usward, to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's a place that you have to come to. There has got to be a work of the Holy Ghost on your life, convicting you of your sin, proving you that you are lost, in order for you to come to that point of repentance. But what is it about repentance? What is repentance? 2 Timothy 2.25 says, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And that's where we get back into Job 33. Repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Repentance is simply acknowledging the truth. Job chapter 33, verse 27, If he look upon men, and he look upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right. Now hold on, let's pause there for just a second. There's a lot of people sitting in prison today who claim, I have sinned and I have perverted that which was right. And if they are let loose, they will jump right back into that wicked life. I myself at one point admitted I had sinned and I perverted that which was right. And I was still lost. What is the key to repentance? It's at the end of this verse. And it profited me not. Do you know why that person in prison or the sinner sitting in the pew or the sinner sitting at home returns to the filth of their sin, it's because they still think there's a profit in them for it. They still believe that there's profit for them. They still believe if they live in this sin, it'll profit them. Why do you return to the drugs? Because you think it profits you. Why do you return to the alcohol? Because you think it profits you. Why do you return to the pornography? Because you think it profits you. You're not repentant. You still love that sin. It's still an idol in your heart. You've got to come to the place where you see, I have sinned. I perverted that which was right. It has not profited me. I'm lost. I need God. That's repentance. When you see that it has profited you, not. And that repentance to the acknowledging of the truth of it. You've acknowledged before God, I've sinned, it profited me not. He sees that heart, and he honors that repentant heart, and grants you eternal life. Seeing the Lord Jesus Christ in everything that he has done on the cross, Jesus is the way to eternal life. He is the only way into eternity. He is the only way into a right relationship with God. But how do you enter into that way? Repentance. Repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says here, again reiterating here, uh, if God peradventure will give them repentance, all right? And then up here we saw uh, let's see, where was it again? Apologize for that. Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. 
Verse 29 says the exact same thing. Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with men. That conviction that you feel when you are under the preaching of the word of God, that is the Holy Ghost convicting you of something you need to repent of in your life. When the preacher is preaching on something, and it is stirring in you, and you are just shaking to the core, and you don't know what's going on, that's the Holy Ghost telling you, you need to repent. God is long-suffering towards us, and that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God gives them repentance through the acknowledging of the truth. James 2.9 says this, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. That's why repentance is more than just going from unbelief to belief. I know a lot of people that believe in God. They believe in the man upstairs. How many times have you ever heard that? Hate that. Hate that. The irreverence in that. Almighty God. That repentant heart, though, that belief has to be there. That faith has to be there. But then you have to see that you have sinned. You have perverted that which was right, and it profited you not. God wants you to come to that place, that place of repentance. He wants you to be born again. Once there, once you have fallen before Almighty God, and you've cried out to Him, and you've repented, and we fall back into sin. You see that there is a point in a person's life, sinless perfection is possible if we do everything that God has written in His Word. However, I'm not preaching the sinless perfection of the saint. Okay? Because we still live in this flesh. Our flesh has not been adopted yet. All right? It will be adopted at the rapture. That's when this flesh will be adopted into the household of God. Right now, this flesh is still carnal. But there's a new man inside of it who has been born again by the Spirit of God. That new man cannot sin. All right? So when I do sin, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. It's no longer that new man, I, that, that sinneth, but sin that dwelleth in me, in my flesh. Paul clarifies all of that all throughout Romans chapter 7. And when we do fall into sin, 1 John 1, 9, and this is how I know that it is, in theory, possible to live a sinless life. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our Just Turn to 1 John with me real quick. I want you to see this with your own eyes. 1 John chapter 1. Starting in verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Right there, it's, it's looking for that, that, that repentant light. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sins. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. There is a chance, not a chance, there is a place where the person, the, the believer, the born-again believer can get to, if they were to follow every single thing that is in this book, and they were to live by every single precept, principle that is in this book, they could live in sinless perfection. 
God has given us everything needed for godliness. Has he not? If there was one thing missing from this book that would be the one thing that would enable us to live a sinless life, then God would be an unjust God because he would not be giving everything we need. But everything we need is in this book. Amen. But when we do fall into sin, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What is confessing? I did it, and it profited me not. That was my, my sin, and it profited me not. He's faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It becomes the posture of the born-again believer. Repentance. Having that repentant heart, hating sin, loving God. Now, instead of the king on the throne of your heart, sin is now a thief hiding in the shadows. That's the difference. Who reigns on the throne of your heart? For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. So repentance is. What is repentance? It's a complete change of mind, agreeing with God that everything he says about you is true. And everything he says about himself is true. The reason you keep going back to your sin is because you don't think it's as bad as God says it is. That's basically it. You don't believe God. To believe God is to believe the Bible. D.L. Moody said this, and, and we'll close with this. He said, listen, friends, repentance is turning right about. In other words, as a soldier would call it, right about face. As someone said, has said, man is born with his back to God. When he truly repents, he turns right around and faces God. Repentance is a change of mind. Now I may feel sorry that I have done a thing and go right back and do it over again. You see, repentance is deeper than a feeling. It is action. It's turning right about. God commands every, men everywhere to turn. Father, thank you for this time that we've had. Lord, I pray that there was clarity. I pray that there would be some uh, hearing this message, Lord, that need to repent. And God, that you would bring them to that place, Lord, and lay heavy conviction of their sin and show them that it has not profited them. Lord, we thank you for the leading of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you that we are taught by the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and God, I pray that as we continue on in your word, Lord, that you would burn these things that we've heard deep within us. Father, for the born-again Christian in this room, that has fallen into a life of sin, Lord, I pray that they would repent this very morning. I pray, Lord, that you would lead them to that place, show them themselves, and show them that you are righteous and holy, and God, that they would get back right with you. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your long suffering, and that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And Lord, I pray that today there would be somebody listening to this that would be born again. Lord, I pray that you would bring them to that place. Show them the Lord Jesus Christ. Show him as the fulfillment of their need. Show him as that final sacrifice, that atonement in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for their sin. And Lord, that they would turn from their wickedness and turn to Christ. We thank you for all that you're doing here. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless and that you would lead us through your word. We thank you for all of this. In the powerful and glorious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray.